right. Uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing this nice uh, workshop. Is the uh, microphone working? Yes. Um, so what I want to talk about is uh, three different projects uh, that I'll try to combine into these 30 minutes. Um, in particular, I'm focusing on developing um, methods that focus on uh, ideally ab initio uh, Hamiltonians and specifically electronic degrees of freedom. And so what I specifically want to talk about is, uh, as I said, three projects that cover each of what I think are the big pillars of uh, uh, making quantum antibody solvers, and that's you know, eigenstate search, time evolution, and open quantum systems, and then even time evolution within uh, open systems. So let me focus on the first one, eigenstate search. I uh, made a lot of progress uh, in, uh, in the last two years, let's say, or three years on uh, developing new algorithms to, to look for eigenstates, uh, also specifically for electronic degrees of freedom. And what I specifically want to talk about is, uh, okay, that doesn't work, um, is about this uh, one new way of optimizing um, uh, any wave function in continuous space. So if you have an electronic, you want to model some molecules, you, you have the continuous space Hamiltonian, you want to optimize it in a better way. Um, so what I want to do is uh, I want to recap a bit in my own language uh, how, um, how I see uh, imaginary time evolution uh, specifically in this case. And the reason I wanted to reformulate this is because, you know, on this, uh, I had a discussion with Marcus Haldo, so who told me, uh, in principle, if you optimize a wave function and you do imaginary time evolution, then everything has to go right. And I'm going to show you that this is actually not the case. There are actually better ways to to work than, than doing imaginary time evolution to optimize the ground state. So what I want to start off from is the imaginary time shading equation, first line. So I've just written that out in terms of, uh, of some wave function. And since we're working with, uh, we have some time reversal symmetry, we, we have a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, so we can actually recast this in terms of uh, real valued wave functions. So I can actually rewrite everything in terms of probabilities. And this is where it gets really interesting because well, this has worked together with a bunch of machine learning researchers, so Max Welling, for example, and we have Kirill uh, at the Vector Institute, uh, who are pure machine learning researchers. Um, and so we discussed a bit, okay, what is variational Monte Carlo now really? Um, so we can recast it, uh, this, this thing of uh, wave functions in terms of something of pro uh, completely probabilities, right? So what I have is a continuity equation, and this continuity equation tells me how probability flows throughout imaginary time, okay? What I see there is that uh, as the probability evolves, uh, the evolution of my probability is proportional to the pr probability itself. And that will be like a key factor that is a bit problematic that I'll try to sketch in the next slide also uh, of you know, where the problems really can come from. And then uh, since we're working in, uh, with a variational model, so we have a restricted variational manifold, we have to project it back onto the variational manifold so we can do this, for example, by optimizing a KL divergence that, you know, uh, reprojects this uh, green arrow back onto the manifold, and so that's how we obtain a new set of parameters that have a better energy. So if I can reformulate VMC, what we're actually trying to do, and this is, again, this is a way to communicate with pure machine learning researchers who, don't, who are not necessarily physicists, is we're trying to minimize a functional, so the energy functional, uh, in a space of probability distributions, and we do that over a variational manifold. Now, there are a lot of cases, of course, in machine learning that are very equivalent to this idea. Um, and so the idea is that while you're minimizing this functional, you're following an, an, an ODE for your uh, probabilities. And this is an interesting idea, again, because, well, there are some famous examples. So this is an example that I took from a paper of uh, Wasserstein Gantz. So if you've been in the, in the machine learning community for a while, there was this very popular generative adversarial networks. I think in 2015 and 16 or so, they were very powerful, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they were completely untrainable. If you ever tried to train this, it just didn't work at all uh, until, yeah, I see somebody nodding, yes, uh, until somebody realized, well, okay, what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to, you know, take these, the data images, which are high dimensional pixels, uh, but they are actually living, you know, the data is living on a lower dimensional manifold. We have a lot of correlations, so the actual data is lower dimensional. And so if we initialize a model, this, uh, model that tries to capture distributions, we initialize it uh, initially very f on a manifold very far away from the actual data distribution. So if we do an, a thought experiment, uh, we can think about a distribution that is a single line. So we just have the blue line here, that's my distribution that I'm trying to capture. 
And the model that I put forward in order to, to capture this is, well, the same. It's a one-dimensional model living in two-dimensional space. Um, and it's just parameterized by one parameter theta that says how, f how far it is along the x-axis. Um, and so what I can do is I can uh, ask myself, okay, what are the typical kind of distance measures or loss functions that I, that I would typically use? Uh, so we all knew, for example, the second one, the KL divergence, uh, which measures, you know, gives you a distance between distributions. Um, and if you look at what the distance is for this specific example, again, we're in a two-dimensional space, but the actual data lies on a lower dimensional, one dimensional manifold, then you see that the KL divergence um, is, uh, you know, it's infinite if we have a theta that is not exactly zero, and otherwise it makes a discrete jump. Of course, I mean, you cannot optimize this thing. You will never get actually anything that is close to, uh, to, to the result theta equals zero. Okay, so of course, like in the machine learning community, people have thought about this, and uh, the answer came from the field of optimal transport, which you know, knows this, this kind of problem. They know about the fact that two distributions sometimes don't overlap. And the way that they formulate the distance is, and I'm not going to explain at this point what, what this means, but they, they essentially say, uh, try to quantify the distance between two distributions by saying how much effort, let's say, it costs to transport one distribution uh, into another one. So and indeed, if you compute the Wasserstein distance or the earth mover distance uh, between these two distributions, you get something that is proportional to theta. So now this is great because now I have something that I can optimize. I just, I can obtain theta in the right way. Um, so what we did is we took this example um, and we said, okay, let's try to define also, let's look at Wasserstein metrics uh, in continuous space. And this is a bit more complicated uh, way of writing things down. But again, uh, Wasserstein metric, essentially what this says is, we have two distributions, P0 and P1. We want to compute a distance measure between them. Um, and we compute uh, some expectation value where we're looking over all the possibilities of how we can transport one distribution, the mass of one distribution, to the mass of the other distribution. That is, you know, in broad terms, what this, what this uh, um, the equation uh, says. And then again, if you define a way of what distance is, you typically also get an ODE from that. And so the ODE, the ODE that you get from that is uh, this uh, on the second line, which is that now you have a continuity equation where the, the distribution, sort of the, the, the probability mass, goes not along a term that is proportional to the density already present, but it's rather along a vector field. So we're propagating an, is this idea of, uh, of optimal transport. We have now a vector field that transports uh, one mass into the other one. I'll show some visualizations later. And then if we try to optimize uh, some functional now with this approach, uh, we get a functional minimizing C Wasserstein uh, approach. Um, and so we can compute what this vector field is actually uh, what it's like, depending on the functional that we're trying to optimize, which in our case is uh, the energy. So if you write it all down, and again, to recap, what we had before was um, if we're using in the imaginary time Schrodinger equation, which I can just tell you is uh, an, an evolution according to the fischer rao metric, we get something that is proportional to the density itself. And now what I'm saying is we need to basically add an extra term that can help us to, to overcome this problem uh, of these different uh, manifolds. And so uh, uh, what, what I'm, again, this is another sketch of what I'm trying to say here is what I told you that variation of Monte Carlo is, it's uh, defining a distribution uh, and how, how it evolves throughout time. And then we do this projection onto the variational manifold. What I've just told you is that instead of doing, uh, taking a Fischer-Rao gradient flow, which is what I would find if I look at the imaginary time shading equation, I can just define another direction according to another metric, which is uh, the Wasserstein uh, gradient flow. And then I just do the same approach like I did before. I project it back onto the variational manifold, okay? And so what is the difference now between both? So in terms of the energy, the left-hand side, I think everybody who has done um, variational Monte Carlo recognizes this, right? So we have some differences between local energies, but then again, something proportional to the, uh, to the existing probability. And on the right-hand side, we now have our different continuity equation. And so on the left-hand side, uh, this is said to be trend, you know, we teleport the same mass. So the idea is there that, again, because it's proportional, the change of density with the density itself, we can only, it's a sort of kind of sink source kind of problem where we remove some mass here and then we let it pop up somewhere else. Um, so if we would look at a two-dimensional bimodal distribution, it needs to first overlap 
with part of the distribution, right? So needs to already overlap, and then it can reduce and put it somewhere else. And initially, yeah, it goes quite fast, but then at some point, you know, it needs to really transport all this mass, and that's when it really goes slow. On the other hand, if we do the same on the, the right-hand side, and now we, we don't do this teleportation, but we rather make a continuous flow, things behave a bit more nicely. It's a, now a simulation where, again, we're just following the probability vector field, and we nicely match between the two distribution without ever needing to do this teleportation. And so, okay, if you, if you now are curious, I do variation on Monte Carlo, what do I need to do in order to implement this algorithm? It's actually pretty easy to do it. It's uh, almost a one-line uh, change. In practice, it's not, but in theory it is. Uh, so given that this is my variation on Monte Carlo algorithm, I have some samples from a distribution Q. What I do is I uh, evolve, imaginary time evolve my distribution. I project it back to the variational manifold, and then I go through this loop again. What I'm telling you now is you can just change this loop, this one item in the loop, and go along a different direction in, uh, uh, in, on, the variation, uh, oh, sorry, on, the, on the probability distribution manifold, but then you just project it uh, back. And so here are some results. Uh, it's a bit noisy because it's molecules, so anybody who's done molecules know that these things are noisy. Uh, what you see is the blue curve uh, are the energies uh, with the traditional variation of Monte Carlo, and then the other curve, so the green one, is purely Wasserstein. Uh, the orange one would be like a hybrid version between both, where we take equal amounts uh, according both to both directions. And we see that in, in all cases, we end up uh, under the, the ground state energies obtained with uh, normal variation of Monte Carlo, specifically in the H10, where you have a lot of multimodality. Uh, we consistently uh, go beyond that. You can see this more clearly in the, in the variance. So the variance is, uh, you know, if it goes to zero, we know that we're hitting an eigenstate. And you see, for example, on the right-hand side that we gain almost uh, an order of magnitude improvement with uh, variational, uh, Wasserstein variational Monte Carlo. So this is a really exciting approach that uh, it's really helping you go. Yeah, you can make it hybrid. It's uh, in every loop you can choose uh, yeah, choose what, what, what you do, right? Uh, we didn't optimize that, but in principle you could, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this was uh, together with uh, Kirill at, uh, at the Vector Institute, so this was really exciting work, just from making a connection and, and sort of trying to explain to each other what we're now actually doing and how we can use uh, the field of uh, machine learning research and the theory from there to improve also uh, our uh, variational Monte Carlo algorithms. Okay, so that was how we can obtain better uh, ground state energies. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is uh, one of the works uh, we've done recently, which is uh, on, uh, on doing time evolution. And so, again, focusing on uh, up initio electronic systems. So for that, I, I'll, even though I used that in the, in the, previous, uh, uh, the previous slides in principle, let me zoom into what are the kind of models that we can use for electronic degrees of freedom. And the reason I want to focus a bit more on that is that for ground states, ground state searches are often easy in a way because they contain not too much correlation. You have a lot of locality. But if you start time evolving things, things are way more difficult. The correlations start building up. They become longer range. And so your simple approximations, uh, I mean, you can think about tensor networks. Okay, they're not simple. But uh, the, the approximations that you make there, once you start doing time evolution, uh, things become uh, yeah, quite difficult. Um, so in a, what the traditional way is of uh, parameterizing things in electronic degrees of freedom is you take the simplest is uh, Hartzi-Fock, right? So you take a single Slater determinant, uh, you know, the particles only interact with a mean field, uh, so you have single particle orbitals. We can make those time dependent. We just evolve this throughout time. Again, there's no really correlations that we can include except, you know, sort of interaction with the mean field. The simplest uh, next thing we can do is to say, well, maybe one determinant was not enough, so let's do the same like we did before, just multiple determinants. But with a polynomial amount of determinants, uh, if you go throughout time, correlation start building up, uh, you won't be able to describe anything anymore. The next thing that people have done then is to look at just row factors, so we can make that also time dependent. And the difficulty there is yeah, it handles correlations really well, but it's a bit restricted in the sense that it inherits all the nodal structure from the single determinant as well. So we're a bit limited there. This would be as if you would do the fusion Monte Carlo on top of a, uh, on top of a choice. You, you cannot change where the nodal surface is. Um, so 
the one thing that I'll, I'll show is to use time-dependent backflow transformations that we introduced. So you can um, think of a backflow transformation in easy terms as we have an interacting system and we map the system of interacting particles onto a non-interacting system. And then we use the, the typical uh, Hartree-Fock approach. So right, we take the original uh, particle positions, we map into a new set of particle positions that knows about the positions of the other ones, and we just take a single splitter determinant and evaluate it. That's how I see backflow transformations. So that's this transformation going from uh, interacting to non-interacting as a backflow transformation. We can make that time dependent again as well, and now we can change the nodal surface and principle describe whatever uh, ground state uh, that we want. Um, and yeah, by making it time dependent now as well, we can also throughout time change the nodal surface and we can uh, accurately uh, capture uh, the, the states of, uh, of fermionic system. And so how do we evolve this thing through time? Um, for that we use, in this case, uh, well the first slides will be based on that, the other one based on a new approach. Um, but we use a time dependent variational principle and so the idea is there that we look at what is the distance between an initial uh, parameterized state uh, phi of theta t. We do a very small time evolution, project it back onto the variational manifold, just like I did in the, in the fischer rao approach before. And what follows from that is an, a linear set of equations where we have theta dot, which is the change of the parameters throughout time, so the, how I need to update my parameters to move through time. And in order to obtain that, I need to compute what's called the, the forces, so the energy gradients. You can estimate that with Monte Carlo. I do that all the time um, with, uh, in variation Monte Carlo as well. Um, and on the left-hand side, we have uh, the geometric tensor, which is sort of the correlations between um, the gradients of your model. Uh, and so for that one, actually, Mattia has a really nice poster on how to do that. Uh, um, so definitely check that out because uh, his method really made it possible to do these things before, uh, for me at least, it was not really feasible to do that in continuous space. Um, and so uh, without going into details, there's a lot of details behind this approach, but um, I just want to show some results and, and convince you that what we're doing makes sense and that it works. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have a first benchmark case. Uh, so we want to compare to a solvable model. So what I can do is I can take one-dimensional uh, fermions I put them in some harmonic well, and I make them interact with some harmonic, uh, uh, harmonic interaction. If I modulate this interaction, so it's an interacting system, first of all, and I can modulate this interaction in such a way that I get the be uh, sort of breathing mode behavior that you see on the left-hand side. So you see uh, the monopole, so you see the, uh, the fermions going out and in uh, based on, on this driving of the system that I'm doing. Um, and what you see is, you know, in, in uh, well, you don't see it, but uh, the exact solution is, is shown in orange, and then you have the, uh, the green one, which is the neural network quantum state uh, approach uh, to this, and you see, well, you see no difference, which means that if, uh, up to long times, even if it's an interacting system, we can actually uh, reproduce the dynamics of the system very well. Uh, then we want to look at a more realistic example, and in uh, quantum chemistry, a lot of people have looked into uh, what is the effect of uh, shining a, a, an intense laser on a diatomic uh, molecule? Um, and so we, we, we simulate the system. Uh, and so what happens is, uh, just to, well, let me maybe visualize it first. So on the top we see the, um, the electric field, and on the bottom we see the distribution of the electrons. We see that uh, as we move through time, the electrons start moving around. And so this is shown here according to the dipole moment. Um, and so I'm comparing here with time departed Hartree Fock uh, with ED within a given basis set, right? And we typically choose a basis set which also restricts the accuracy that we can, can have. Um, and so the first thing uh, you can see is that uh, I'm showing in uh, the S3O3G uh, basis, which is a small basis set, um, the, the results of, uh, of ED, and we, this is like the smallest green curve. Um, if we're using neural network quantum states in that same basis in second quantization, we can do the, the dynamics uh, almost exactly the same. We don't see a difference. Now if I start increasing the, the basis set, so I start making, looking at a bigger Hilbert space, um, I'm getting you know, more accurate to the real dynamics. Um, and so what we see again is uh, that the effect seems to be that the, the oscillations are a bit damped. We see some uh, interference structure on top of it. And then at later times, they start oscillating a bit longer. Now we don't actually have to be restricted because we're doing it fully up in ESO. We don't need to choose a basis set, so we can actually 
take a continuous model, it can be a neural network, whatever you want, uh, and evolve that through your time, and you see some, uh, which is now the uh, S plus C plus BF, so the backflow transformation um, throughout time, and we can actually get really, uh, really good re results that go beyond exact diagonalization uh, in a given basis set. And then the last example I want to show is, uh, is the quantum dot. So the idea there is that we take a few electrons, we put them in a harmonic well, and then they interact with each other through the, uh, through the Coulomb potential. And by changing the properties of the material that, that this uh, quantum dot is in, we can quench the interaction so we can, it's as if we are modifying the, the Coulomb potential. So that's uh, this kappa. So we quench this system, so we first look at the ground state, we quench the system, and we look at how it evolves through time. What will happen is, again, a sort of monopole form on the left, but I'm not going to show that. What I want to show is what is the effect of, of these backflow transformation and time, well, time-dependent backflow transformation. So on the top, you see R square, which is the integration error. So the lower the R2, the more we satisfy uh, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And so what you see is uh, S means just a single state it determines. Then in uh, blue, I add a adjuster, a time-dependent adjuster to it, and then finally a backflow transformation. And you see that as we evolve through time, the, uh, the accuracy you know, improves by an order of magnitude, so we can really, using time-dependent backflow transformation, we can get accurate results. And now I'm telling you also always that in, in, uh, in dynamics, it's mainly the correlations that are important, and I just want to highlight that by looking at the G2. So the G2 is a quantity that looks at correlations, and it's zero if you have no correlations. So indeed, uh, the green, we confirm this by looking at our single state to determine there are never correlations. And what we observe is if we look at uh, just row and backflow correlations, that indeed in the very first few time steps, a lot of correlations build up and then they dominate the rest of the dynamics. So you cannot, uh, even simple approximations will typically break down at the initial uh, few time steps. Um, and then this is with another method that uh, is not a, it's not on the archive yet, so I didn't want to show the approach, but it's a new approach of doing dynamics. Um, and it's specifically shown now for a simple model, it's a spinless uh, fermions, let's say, so fermions um, interacting via the TV model, so we have some hopping terms and a nearest neighbor interaction term. And again, what we do is we, we look at free fermions and then we quench it and make them interact with each other, so it's like changing the medium. Um, and what we see is, uh, you see the different kinds of uh, lines, the, uh, the S again corresponds to a single state determinant, so things start deviating quite rapidly compared to ED. And on the bottom plot, I show you the infidelity from step to step, which is also the lower, the better. And you see that, we, again, with backflow transformation, time-dependent backflow transformations, you can get essentially any, uh, any accuracy you want. Uh, and then finally, this is a bit of a different topic, but uh, I'm still enthusiastic about uh, what we did there, so it's not necessarily fermions, but it would be cool to extend this also to fermions, is the idea of now, uh, doing the same like before, you know, looking at quantum dynamics, but seeing what the effect is of uh, putting things at a finite temperature. Um, so the first thing we do uh, is uh, we prepare a thermal state. So how do you prepare a thermal state? Well, typically that's done do through something uh, which is you know, imaginary time evolving. So the idea behind that is that if you write down what a, a thermal observable looks like, um, we have, and we rewrite things a bit, we get this sum over n, which is the Hilbert space, uh, and we evolve an initial state, just a basis state, over uh, an imaginary time beta over two, according to the Hamiltonian uh, that, we, that we're considering. And so there are m multiple different approaches to do that. Um, so there are some popular techniques. Um, and the first one is just to take this formula as it is and to sample, indeed, uh, sam sample basis states in my Hilbert space, evolving them over beta over two, where beta is the inverse temperature, um, and just doing this multiple times. And in the TPQ theorem tells us that as the system size increases, we actually need exponentially few uh, samples uh, to do this. And uh, MATS is uh, another approach that's commonly used for, um, for tensor networks. Um, and there is a sort of same idea, but you do a Markov chain uh, version of it, let's say. So you evolve through time, you sample from it, and you restart it uh, to, to evolve again through time. Uh, now, with neural network quantum states, we preferably don't do too many time evolutions because it's honestly expensive, but what we can do better than these other methods is we can better handle correlations, right? That's the whole thing about neural networks is that in principle they can handle volume law entanglement. So I preferably I take something that is different than these approaches, but something that can actually go through highly entangled uh, states. 
So what we do is we think again about, um, about uh, what a thermal observable looks like. Um, and so we, we look at the trace, and what we can also do is instead of sampling over these states and evolving them through time, is rather to introduce an auxiliary system that takes the effect of, of tracing out uh, the, well, I mean, generating this trace. And so the idea is that we introduce uh, what's called thermal field doubles. So it's essentially as if you would take the density matrix, you have the rows, you have the columns, the thermal field doubles would be sort of the, the columns, okay? So these are the column samples. And so what, if we, what this uh, equation tells us is that if we start from the identity state, so again, in terms of density matrix, it's just the identity matrix, um, the diagonal, diagonal matrix, if we now evolve it over beta over two according to a Hamiltonian that only operates on, let's say, the rows, um, then we will actually be able to compute thermal observables. And so what we need to do in order to start this evolution is we need to start from the identity state, so the infinite temperature state, which uh, is basically a set of uh, product uh, states where we pairwise entangle uh, or spin systems, which is uh, the one that we consider in sigma, which are maximally entangled with an additional auxiliary system, the thermal field doubles, which again are these columns of the density matrix. And so the first thing we need to solve is we need to make sure that the, the neural network that we evolve through time uh, can exactly represent this initial state. And so yeah, we have multiple ways of doing that now. Um, but I don't want to necessarily show about you know, how, how well we are pre preparing thermal states. I want to show that the next cool thing, which I like even more, which is now once we've prepared the thermal state, is that we can also quench it and look at uh, quantum dynamics of it. So the first question we have is, okay, we have a thermal state. Now I've introduced these thermal field doubles. Uh, what is the Hamiltonian that we need to evolve over? And so if you, if you do the math, uh, simple math, but you, you get in the end uh, something like this. So what I, again, what I'm doing is I'm looking rather at an open system, but I'm just rewriting it as uh, a unitary dynamics uh, within this double space. And so the Hamiltonian that I need to evolve over is my Hamiltonian ap applied to the physical system minus my Hamiltonian applied to the unphysical system. So again, I just use the same machinery that I used in the previous uh, slides on doing quantum dynamics for, for electrons, and I just uh, evolve this uh, thermal state through time. And so here are some uh, results uh, on uh, the 4x4 four four and the 6x6 six six transverse field ising. So what we've done is we create the thermal states of the transverse field ising, and then we quench it with the longitudinal field, and we break uh, the symmetry. And so the left-hand side is uh, the ZZ correlation, YY correlation. YY is just very difficult in Monte Carlo approximations because it's a cancellation between all diagonal terms. So it's uh, one that we really wanted to get right. And so by introducing a new way of doing imaginary time evolution, which we call PIDE, uh, I won't discuss the details, but uh, check out the paper. It's a really stable method uh, that allowed us to do this. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible. There, were, there was some work on this already before, also from uh, Yusuke Nomura, who was able to do the imaginary time. But then if we really wanted to do the real time after, we needed to do this way more accurately, like with a higher precision uh, than, than was available before. And so you see that uh, we can accurately reproduce um, the, so we're comparing it to METs uh, that we can uh, uh, run for these 4x4 four four systems. We can accurately reproduce those results. Once we've uh, evolved through imaginary time, we pick out some of the beta values and we quench it in the real time. And that's what you see on the right-hand side is the observables, the thermal observables uh, throughout time. And you see that we don't see it that clearly, but the effect of the temperature seems to be in it that the oscillation sort of gets, gets damped a bit uh, for higher temperatures. Um, so some nice side products of this uh, project is that we have a new way uh, of um, representing physical density matrix, so avoiding that we go outside the space of physical density matrix. Uh, specifically, we found a new way of uh, representing thermal states, uh, which we call Arno, as a, uh, as a, as a thermal states for your autoregressive model. So if you want to study topological states and see the effect of temperature on topological states, this is the way to go. So if you like that kind of stuff, read the paper. Um, we can actually represent now any uh, neural network quantum states as a thermal state, so we're not only restricted to previous work that just used uh, RBMs. Uh, and the last one is, uh, as I mentioned, the only reason that we actually were able to do this is by inventing a new way of doing imaginary time evolution, uh, which is based on this sort of convolutional sampling uh, uh, by optimizing fidelity. So again, not, won't give the details, just wanted to flash it, so if you're interested, uh, so you would read the paper. 
And uh, so I'll, fi uh, I'll finish there. So just to recap, what I've shown you is three sort of related projects, but I found this, they're all a bit related. Um, the first one is a new way to do imaginary time evolution. Well, something different than it, but to look for ground states, a new way of doing variational Monte Carlo. Uh, the second one was uh, to look at quantum dynamics of up initial electronic Hamiltonians. And the last one is to accurately model quantum dynamics of uh, thermal states. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? Maybe I can start. Uh, once you perform the backflow in the determinant, why do you need uh, also the just row factor? You don't need it. You can also absorb it. It's just something I always start from that one uh, and then I add the backflow to it. It's just more, it's often a more efficient way of capturing things. Uh, but you can choose, like we also did the electron gas, and there we don't even need a just row factor, so. But in principle, you can. Uh... In principle, you don't need the just row factor, yeah. Hey, um, so to, uh, to combine your two uh, topics of interest, what would it take, just a speculative question, what would it take to do fermions in real space for finite temperature? Because that's what a lot of condensed matter physicists care about. And you know, if you can show some phase diagram of a decent number of fermions as a function of a temperature using ab initio methods a la NQS, that'd be really cool. Working on it then. Yeah, so I have a method now based on uh, some of these topics that I've introduced that will actually allow to do that. But it's, it's not an easy one because there, in continuous space, the first question you have is, how do you represent the infinite temperature state, right? Uh, so there you need to, the first thing you need to do is find a way around that. But yeah, good, uh, good question. Yeah, yeah, this is McLaughlin. So, I, so it depends, like they all combine to the same thing if you're looking at holomorphic functions. Um, so some of, the, I don't, well, some of the results here were, were actually with uh, holomorphic uh, neural networks. Uh, so then it doesn't really matter. Um, so the, uh, McLaughlin is it's a nicer one, I mean some, some of them just don't respect, for example, energy conservation, so it depends on what you're after. For me, McLaughlin is, makes most sense. It, it conserves the energy in principle. So. Other questions? Okay, maybe we can say thanks again to the speaker.